Now we have a, a conference for Simone Yamarino. I have to say that I'm very, very happy of this. Not only because she's there, but it was I wanted to chair her for a very long time. <laughs> and we discussed this long time ago. <laughs> and now I have this opportunity. So, and I took the privilege of a president to chair her. So I'm very, very happy of, of this. I think there is no need to present uh, Simona Yamarino, but I will say a few words. Uh, as you uh, probably know, she's professor of economic geography in the Department of Geography and Environment at the London School of Economics. She was also the head of this uh, department a few years ago and academic member of the uh, LSE Council. Uh, she was, uh, Simona was elected fellow of various associations like the Academy of Social Sciences, the Regional Studies Association, and the Royal Society for Arts, Manufacture, and Commerce. And she is uh, nowadays a co-editor of the Journal of Economic Geography, and she has a long-term uh, experience in uh, founded uh, research, international research project, and a consultancy, for example, for the EU Commission, the OECD, the United Nations, so on, and, and several government uh, agencies. Uh, Simona's uh, main research interest, you know them, uh, they lie in multinational corporations, globalization, local economic development, uh, geography of innovation, uh, technological change, regional systems of innovation, regional and local economic development and policy. Uh, so that's a lot of uh, the fields and a lot of very, very uh, acute and interesting uh, researchers. She has published more than 60 papers in major peer-reviewed uh, journals, two author, um, co-authored books, and around and a lot of uh, book chapters, uh, policy papers, policy report, and other uh, pub publication. So I'm very happy to introduce uh, Simone and to let uh, the floor to her on her uh, very insightful uh, presentation about innovation now. Uh, thank you for, uh, to the organizer, to the Ersen and the organizer, local organizer for inviting me here. It's a big honor and uh, is also, uh, uh, I mean, quite intimidating for Ersa uh, giving a speech. So is, uh, I'm very, very pleased. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, technology, corporate power and regional inequality, taking somehow a complementary perspective uh, to, with respect to Michael's presentation. And so the, the, there might be some debate on this. I am worried, I'm worried in general terms for the state of the world, for we have a, we have a, a war in Europe, but wars are not only in Europe and many very, very worrying trends. So I try to focus on three blocks of worries on which I do my research and with this life motive of technology and corporate power. So I will start by talking about agglomeration economies and monopoly and focus on big tech, big tech acquisitions and regional inequality in the US. I will then, I mean, go from big tech, which are a bit the life motive of this presentation, and their technological advantage based on the exploitation of natural resources, in particular critical and raw, raw materials. And then from there, big tech will lead us in some of the new emerging trends on uh, uh, forced labor and the geography of forced labor. I hope to, you know, be able to cover all this. Now, the first part of my talk, it would be really good to have this thing moved because I know, anyway, uh, is on, uh, um, on uh, based on work with Marianne Feldman, uh, Frederick Gaui, who is here in the audience, and uh, um, Caroline Joramashvili. The first paper has been already published. The second one is a working paper. So, um, can we actually move that window there? I mean, it's, it's quite disturbing to have, sorry, both for the people online that see this thing. Uh, maybe, yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Balash. 
OK, so let me go back to the theory. Some of you have already followed and or see this argument before. I mean, in a nutshell, increasing returns to place, OK? Pure agglomeration economy. You teach me what it is, because we are in an audience. I don't need to go through localization, benign Marshallian forces, and urbanization that tells us bigger is better, because it's more diverse, and this leads us to more ideas, creativity, and innovation. On the other hand, this has been affected by the spatial unbundling in globalization processes. So global value chains, global production networks, global commodity chains, all this thanks to a very, very fast technological pace, division of labor slices in very, very thin and across the world, internationally reduced tariffs, regulation barrier, of which the multinational corporations have taken a big uh, uh, advantage, and spatial concentration at the same time of this type that dispersion in a few places, particularly for what regard, regard high value added function. So let's go back to Michael's US top earners, the change between 1980, which is a very important year in the US. It was the year Ronald Reagan was elected, OK? And 2016. This is just, this map shows the change. These are 709 commuting zone in, uh, uh, in the US. And this shows you basically the 20 top earner percent of the distribution. And you know, you could see that what has lost in all this period is precisely the American Midwest. If you look at the map in 1980, the most, the top earners, the highest share was in Gary, Indiana, a steel manufacturing center close to Chicago. Since then, the winners, the real winners, have been San Francisco, San Jose, the Silicon Valley area, and Boston, Washington, DC, New York, the centers of big finance. Now, fixing inequality, when it is due to increasing returns to place, so external to the firms, we know, we talked about it also before, what it takes. Well, if you are a firm, either you move to the big city, or you make the place better. You try to make your place better. Specialize smartly, reform local institutions, attract foreign direct investment, invest in innovation, human capital, entrepreneurship, creativity, promote high-tech digital startups. However, let's look at market structure from a different perspective, monopoly. Monopoly means increasing returns to firms, not to the place. Technology has changed and has facilitated some business models. What we have seen is the emergence of information-based network business model and platform business model. Platform, what is a platform? Platform link to end to sides of a transaction, okay? So customers and suppliers in the Amazon marketplace or uh, friends on Facebook, okay? That is the platform business model to which we also uh, consider in the same kind of league of business model others that are based on proprietary uh, um, general purpose software. Think about Microsoft and its, you know, uh, a window operating system. It can be also, it goes also beyond the, uh, 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 the digital, okay? If you think about uh, uh, other kind of network models based on IPR, right? I mean, think about uh, 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 Monsanto and Bayer and the seeds that are actually distributed across farmers all over the world. Anyway, are these natural monopolies? I doubt, we doubt, actually. Often not. They are contingent of control of access to platform networks, okay? We all know that. I mean, you know, Microsoft is actually locking in parts of web and use 
uh, uh, what is actually open software. By linking and by you know, restricting us to the network, there are precisely proprietary formats, standards that depends on political choices. At the end of the day, interaction between this network platform externalities and the agglomeration externalities in some places causes a sort of, you know, speciality in these places, which is amplified by financialization because, as we know, the regulation in the financial sector and the global finance has been very, very fast and very strong. And, uh, and this means that, you know, the concentration of finance, big firms with monopoly power and external economies have created a mechanism that draws resources more and more towards these successful places. This is obviously a consequence of institutional change. In the US, the change in antitrust doctrine, okay? I, as you know, I'm European, but my co-authors are Americans. And the Bork interpretation of the antitrust uh, 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 is based on the recognition that the consumer is harmed. If there is not that recognition, actually, that could, I mean, it, 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 the antitrust doesn't click on. In fact, since the Bork interpretation, antitrust cases under the Federal uh, Trade Commission have dried up in America, okay? Expanded IPR, I will show you later one example, deregulation, and so on and so forth. So, uh, this is not our argument, of, of, uh, actually. You can see here Eggerson and others that show the increase from 1980s to 2015 of the markups. And this is actually something very interesting from Caligaris, Criscuolo, and Marco Lin that shows that actually this huge rise in markup and profits is also true for gen more generally OECD countries. We did this exercise, small exercises also ourselves, and this is again the change across uh, the community zone in the US between the ratio between market value or market capitalization, other, in other terms, what the firms are worth on the stock market relative to the value of asset of the firm, so intangible and tangible assets of the firm. The higher the ratio, the higher the spread, the higher the entry barriers is commonly used as a measure of monopoly. And you can see, actually, the market power where, where it is risen. Again, California, Silicon Valley, and the center of either political power, Washington DC, or financial power in the US. Now, as I was saying, Marshallian externality meets monopoly powers. When these two things mix and interact, okay, I mean, um, um, each amplify each other. For example, the agglomeration, the amplification of agglomeration advantages. Why? Because, I mean, it, there is a logic of winner takes soul. The best talent, the 20 top percent of earners are attracted in these places, and also the latest knowledge, the latest information that is actually provided also by universities that are more peripheral, but attracted in these places. There is a very important market for startup. Startup, the objective of small digital startup is to be sold to I mean, bigger companies. This is something that if you go nowadays in San Francisco's bar, you can hear it without knowing anything. You can hear it. Young entrepreneurs that, you know, just aim to be, to be acquired by the big tech. Google, Amazon, uh, uh, Google, Apple, Facebook objective, on the other hand, and there is a lot of literature in economics that shows that, is acquire or kill the competitor, right? Both strategies, in fact, we argue, take advantage, benefit from co-location in the same place. Also because that is also creating proximity to where, where venture capital is, okay? So, 
big tech acquisition and US regional inequality. This is a precisely the work that is uh, uh, now in progress. Digital startups are elements in many local economic development policies, as we know also in Europe. But these digital startups have a very low fixed capital requirement, can be anywhere. All you need is a stable internet connection and electricity, right? So everywhere in the world, I mean, in the, in, the, in the relatively richer part of the world, okay? And weightless products, weightless products, apparently foot loose, you don't need big plants or big, big labor force, okay? Founders, however, tend to stay where they are. They would rather be where they first establish. However, this ecology of big tech, start uh, big tech hubs tend, as we saw, to have skilled labor, attract skilled labor, and venture capital. So a firm, a small digital startup, start, look for funding. It can be IPO, initial public offering, but it's very rare in our, I mean, uh, exploration of 3,500 and more acquisition of big tech, of, of, of in some sectors we found only 260 IPO, or, move to big tech hub, okay? So there is this migration of small companies from many other regions and states in the US to the tech cities. The firms acquired by the, tech, the, the, by the big tech, disproportionately relative to the sectors where they operate, concentrated, are concentrated in tic tac cities and hub, okay? In this sense, I show that Marshallian productivity plus prospect of share monopoly rents creates more and more feed up this agglomeration. So this is our comparative analysis, precisely you can see, we focus on seven big tech because there are some characteristics. You can see that more in detail in the paper. Google, Adobe, uh, Apple, Facebook, Oracle, and two in Seattle, Amazon and Microsoft. And we look at all the acquisition between 1997 and 2020 their location compared with the location of four comparator groups that I always forget what they are, but the data sources are a combined database plus a very, very detailed work done on the web companies. Uh, so Bureau Van Dijk, Zephyr, S&P, Capital IQ, and SD Platinum, the four groups are uh, ad all other US non-big tech acquisition in the same sectors, and then a subgroup where uh, other business invested by this, the VC, the, the venture capital who sold firms to tech, to tech uh, uh, giants, and companies in those sectors that made IPO, and then companies in those sectors that receive small, uh, small business administration grants. So we compared with this group. In any case, here you can see the geography of targets, okay? Uh, we have out of 600, sorry, I'm not very good in remembering, uh, uh, 646 uh, acquisition, you can see that 310 over time are in San Francisco, San Jose, with some other layers that are New York, Boston, more or less the geography we've seen before. And, for example, London, okay? Out of 50 acquisitions in the UK, 43 are in London. Uh, of the seven big tech. This is big tech acquisition relative to all other US acquisition, and you can see that, I mean, from the bowls, where it's white, basically is acquisitions, but non-big tech, while this, the, the, the color gives us the intensity of big tech acquisition uh, uh, in these sectors. The sectors, sorry, that we consider are just three of which two-thirds of the acquisition of all big techs are happening in computer programming services, prepackaged software, computer processing, and data preparation and services. So this is another interesting story because here we compare the number of, uh, of um, 
uh, small business administration loan to firms that look for financing, okay? And you can see that the geography is quite well spread, but if you look at this as a ratio of big tech acquisition on the loans, there are two locations that stood up in particular, and it's San Francisco and San Jose. So, I mean, what are the main lessons on this, uh, on this story? Traditional economic geography theory tells us that these tech cities hubs are attractive because they are productive, because the, these Marshallian economies are actually available to everybody, and this raises productivity, but much of this productivity in tech cities is due to monop monopoly rents, and this is particularly evident in the case of the US, okay? There are distinguishing features, and this connects to the discussion that we were having before with Michael. You know, Europe is different, okay? Although some of this in other sectors can be replicated also for Europe, which is one of our line of research. Pure spatial explanation need to take into account, therefore, market structure that got somehow thrown out of the window along the way of theorizing in economic geography. The spatial polarization of income opportunity, the frequent failure of development policy needs regulation. Needs regulation of monopoly power, needs regulation of financial system. And here I'm going to quote uh, my friend and co-author Marianne Feldman at the Global Conference of Economic Geography in Dublin in June, fix the system before fixing the place. Some implication. I mean, as said, you know, if we treat regional development policy as, you know, treating agglomeration economies as an attribute of places instead of this interaction with some internal increasing return to firm, I mean, you know, it's, it's something that is bound to, to, to create failure. And far from offering a model for left behind places, uh, the concept of which we, we due to my uh, co-author and good friends, Andres Rodriguez Posse, monopolies actually hold back places, okay? By appropriating revenues, taxes on all business around the world, right? Think about uh, Airbnb or uh, Uber or, you know, they are almost non-existent firms located somewhere and tax firms and location all over the planet, restricting use of basic knowledge and degrading capability elsewhere by dragging the best graduates. We have many examples of that towards the hub, diverting capital because finance does exactly this. Finance actually extract free cash flow from non-competitive sectors that are obviously located elsewhere and centralize, canalize these resources toward the digital startups that can potentially be bought by monopoly. However, going back to within and between regions, I mean, this causes problem also within, as Michael was saying, right? San Francisco, I mean, we know San Francisco very well because Frederick is from there, we go regularly, and actually, you know, also the <laughs> inequality within San Francisco now can be uh, seen as one of the most, uh, 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 you know, p p worrying in the world. And uh, there is uh, this fantastic paper by uh, uh, Olaf Sorensen and co-author, the Silicon Valley Syndrome, that, uh, you know, support this argument. Now, uh, therefore, I, I, I mean, what we claim is, although the US State Attorney Generals, the European Commission have signaled in the, few, the last few years some realization that platform business models are not a technological inevitability, right? But equally due to government choices, national and supranational, that the failure to regulate, although there is this realization, still in 2021, during the pandemic, Amazon, Microsoft, Alphabet went on buying and buying and acquiring digital startup. Okay, this is, this is uh, press and other IPR monopolies. Okay, think about, think about the, the big pharma, think about the COVID vaccine. 
okay? And uh, you, you, you could hear uh, last year, at the end of last year, the Pfizer chief executive, okay, Burla, that derided sharing IPR and said it was dangerous to share companies' intellectual property. At the same time, declaring that the vaccine brought to the company $37 billion in one year, which is probably the most lucrative medicine in even given year in history. Okay? So, from one to two, today tech's giant are building their innovation not only on their own, as we have seen. At the same time, however, they are sued on their technology based on uh, uh, natural resources exploitation. So, for example, I have hundreds of this, right? Um, Apple, Dell, Microsoft, Tesla, Google, parent company, Alphabet, uh, are, are, were sued for uh, uh, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, a cobalt mine on child labor exploitation. So this is the second point that I want to make. This is based on some work with Andreas Diemer, uh, Richard Perkins, Axel Growth, um, and uh, Andrea Scani and George Lee, there are several people. The, the first one has just been published in regional studies, the others are working paper, where we consider this relationship between technological demand on the one hand and critical uh, material. So, mining of critical raw material, including conflict minerals, okay, that uh, uh, formally are regarded as the three uh, T, tungsten, tin, and tantalum plus gold, but that, I mean, some, and I think is the case, should include also cobalt and uh, lithium. Their combination, their use, their refinement creates a material infrastructure to the shift to industry 4.0, 4 okay? So some of these critical materials, there are different subdivisions, I cannot go into each of that, either critical and conflict materials or uh, uh, um, um, rare metals, okay? They, these, are, uh, these have different properties. We have collaborating with uh, a group of geologists in the British uh, uh, Geological uh, uh, um, association in order to understand a bit more what we were talking about because it's not easy. I mean, are seen as great criticality in the innovation frontier, increasing concern that the supply of the mining industry to feed the shift from ICT to new technologies, uh, artificial intelligence and so on and so forth, uh, will be unlikely to meet the demand, particularly in regard to renewable energy transition, technology transition, okay? So the relevance of the problem is everywhere, okay? There are uh, reports from, uh, uh, from the US government, trade government, U McKinsey, uh, World Bank, uh, European Commission. This is really a hot topic in the last couple of years. One example of the problem, you can see, I mean, the growth of the increase of the cobalt. I chose cobalt, why? Because as you can see from here, the Democratic Republic of Congo is uh, 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 the biggest exporter in the world with 36% of export, but this is not in compare and the export data don't tell you much, is the natural reserves and apparently only two regions in Congo, North Kivu and Katanga, actually own more than 60% of the global reserves of uh, cobalt, okay? So we have a problem. And the problem is that the association between conflict, fatalities, and this critical and, uh, and uh, uh, conflict minerals mining across southern, central, and West African countries is very evident, okay? There is, uh, there is research, this is Adil Said, one of our PhD students at the LSC that is looking into it, 
and the international responses have obviously focused on the implementation of human rights, due diligence in companies, you know, but there is no uh, a kind of approach that looks at development-oriented intervention, and therefore geographically specific, because also in the case of Congo, it's not the whole Congo uh, per se. So, what we did, we did tax mining, and therefore we, we did a thorough tax mining with uh, natural processing uh, uh, techniques, looking at all the, uh, all the mm, uh, patent text uh, between on, on, on uh, patent view, USPTO, between 1976 and 2017, and, you know, we focus on groups of technology. I mean, it's a huge work. And this is just a simple test to see if ICT technology, that is the blue line, is statistically significant in terms of its intensity of keywords, either relative or, or so that cite these materials. Obviously, this has been validated with different techniques, also with data on production, in order to make sure that we weren't capturing something random. And here, I, AI technologies, I have to be clear on this, is a subgroup of ICT only. And as you can see, it's not that intense as, and, uh, as ICT. We couldn't look at the other AI because the work was too massive, we will. What we see here, these are conditional means of relative frequency of these keywords, of these minerals, materials, and you can see that ICT, that there is an increase over time anyway in the reliance of new technology on this mineral, but that the ICT is consistently, I mean, different, statistically different, and much more uh, uh, inclined to use this technology. Go back to the big tech giants. This uh, is only the top 20, uh, sorry, it's impossible to read, I am aware, but in the top 25, top 50 of these firms, you find Samsung, IBM, Canon, Micro uh, um, Technology, Sony, Intel, Apple, and Microsoft, okay? So always there, these are the, uh, the, 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 the firms that patents and are more reliant on this technology. We did also short correlation, simple exercise of a correlation between episode, so the dependent variable here is basically the uh, episode the counts, sorry, counts of conflicts by macro region according to the Uppsala, uh, Uppsala sorry, conflict data program, and the independent variable is our keywords intensity, right? And what we find is in fact an association between conflict causality and, uh, and conflict mineral intensity that is apart from uh, uh, um, tantalum, uh, no, sorry, tungsten that you cannot see here, um, is, 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 is significant in the case of Africa, Southern America, okay, Central and Southern America, not uh, North America, because here we had to uh, uh, associate, and uh, Middle East, not for Europe and not for North America, okay? So this is, this is finally a map that we did where, I mean, it shows basically the geography of mining, so conflict and critical material production versus innovation based on this critical material. And, you know, the main lessons are, the main lesson is that evidence of a significant increase on the reliance of new technology in ICT on these critical materials, okay? And the ICT paradigm is not only strongly associated, but also more and more associated with these materials. So there are different levels of spatial disparities here, right? Between the location that are producing, Global South mostly, and some of the region of Global South, as I said, and on the other hand, the majority of technological innovation in some of the places of the Global North. 
okay? Uh, just quickly what we are doing now on the topic is obviously we are looking for some, uh, for some kind of causality proof because uh, in looking now bit, uh, at the relationship between technological innovation and rare metals, that is another overlapping subgroup, uh, you can say yes, I mean the supply influence technological innovation but it's also can be the other way around, that breakthroughs in technology actually push the producers to uh, produce more. And so, this is just to show you because it's not an easy, uh, an easy story, uh, we look at the metal companion because most of these rare metals are not found in the, on their own in nature, but they are produced as companion metals of more general use, copper, iron, aluminium. And so that is not related with technology and therefore we are starting to look into this, focusing in particular on green energy transition sectors, solar energy, wind energy and batteries. Our very preliminary resource, uh, results, this is with George Lee, ex-PhD student at the LSE, is that controlling for other factors both product export and patent output of renewable energy respond negatively to increases in prices of rare metal. And this impact is also found to be related to country characteristic. You can see here the same story that I was saying before, right? Here is where is the supply, right? And no OECD country has the most share. And here is innovation where non-OECD countries actually disappear and is all concentrated in the OECD. So, main lesson also from this, crucial to understand the determinant and condition of green transition is also to look at the physical material basis of these technologies because we, we look at a shift from uh, resource supply challenges from uh, conventional energy to critical raw materials and you know renewable energy transition obviously I mean creates environmental issues in some uh, resolves uh, environmental problems in some economies at the expenses of creating pollution or violation of human rights in other less developed economies and you know this is again on the newspaper uh, 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 quite uh, quite uh, uh, prominently now from part two to my last part uh, this is this is taken from a speech that Elisa Giuliani gave to our master local economic development a few years ago uh, looking at mining cluster in Peru, violation of indigenous communities' rights and violation of labor uh, uh, rights, okay? But we don't have labor, forced labor only in the global south, okay? And more and more you see this on uh, the press, okay? And uh, I don't know if you, if you are familiar with Nomadland's uh, uh, Barbara Bruder uh, book that then became a very well-known film in 2020, was, uh, uh, got a lot of prizes uh, and uh, a lot of debates, okay? Amazon is a disaster for work. Uh, Nomadland glosses over that. Actually, the book is much tougher, I read, uh, comparing to the film. And the Guardian was actually saying, the film doesn't glamorize life at Amazon, but it's undeniably useful to the corporation to have a prestigious film to give political cover. Okay, so the third and last bit, this is really, really in progress. This is based on work that I'm doing with Daria Denti. Uh, on the economic geography of forced labor in advanced economies. Uh, Daria Denti is uh, 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 a researcher at the GSSI in L'Aquila. And so, when the system that Marianne was <laughs> recalling in her lecture doesn't work, okay? Modern slavery, despite being illegal, despite being, you know, uh, 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 um, 
you know, obviously uh, the public perception in, in the West is absolutely horrified by, by, by uh, talking about modern slavery, but is in the global north, not only in the global south. Existing research focuses on cross-country trends, uh, victim-related issues from protection to recovery, but evidence on the socioeconomic characteristics that influence firms' demand for forced labor in the global north is very, very scanty, okay? The issues strongly interact with economic geography again, as firms' behavior, as we know, depend on, uh, on that. Yes, I'm, I'm done, okay? So these are the preliminary insights quantitative estimation of the micro-regional uh, risk factor associated to forced labor, we had to start from Italy. We would have loved to continue the story of Amazon in the US and the big tech. Uh, 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 I use them as a bridge, but unfortunately, this data are information are really difficult. It's been three years and we are really far away from what we want to be, okay? Italy, however, which is my country, uh, uh, is, is, is ranked third among Western European countries for prevalence of modern slavery, which I'm obviously I'm, I'm really very ashamed of, okay? So there are very strong limitations in obtaining microdata and micro-regional at the level of labor market area. Uh, so that's why we are in Italy where both Italians, I mean, you know, we, 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 it's easier <laughs> to find some way. So we are putting uh, together a novel database that is based on uh, co information collection from institutions, NGOs, ad hoc observatory, internet, and also talking a lot to people that are specialized in the field. And we focus on an episode of forced labor, not in agriculture, um, which, are in, which is increasing in Italy, following a European trend after co a COVID. So you can see, no, you cannot see because part of the slide is covered, but in any case, after COVID, you can see that the non-agriculture uh, cases of uh, uh, lab forced labor is going up. One, one thing that I want to show you that these are very preliminary results, by looking into the possible confounding factors, we focus on unemployment and the geography of refugees, right? Which could be, I mean, obviously explanatory of modern slavery. However, our preliminary uh, uh, evidence, you can see from the map, is that, you know, lab this is occurrence of modern slavery that do not correlate with unemployment, okay, at all and not only with the north-south divide that I would have expected, absolutely. They are not, and here they do not correspond to the geography of refugees in 2016, 2020. So basically, basically what we could found, find so far is that what they correlate with is specialization patterns of the local labor matter area a strong correlation is found between forced labor occurrence and made in Italy and urban specialized local labor markets. So um, 70, I think is 60%, and I'm really there, 60% eh? um, of uh, the um, local labor market, special in industrial districts, right? Specialized uh, um, are uh, report modern slavery, and uh, uh, and uh, the seventy-eight percent of urban specialized local labor market areas, yeah, has occurrence of modern slavery. What is not correlated with modern slavery are heavy industry because heavily regulated still, uh, non-specialized and touristic uh, uh, local labor market. So these are very preliminary results, right? We'll go ahead. More, more work to be done by our community. Okay, let me finish. Technology 
is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. And this is something that uh, I learned at SPRU. I'm an ex-SPRU, University of Sussex, and this I've always known. So place-based makes sense. We, we have been proponents here when designing development policy for left behind, held back, and particularly now with the new work with Andres Rodriguez Posse, Michael Storpers, and Andrea Diemer, trapped regions. But, there is a but. To understand and act on this huge regional disparity of places and people in a digitizing world, we think that we need to understand also the institutional void the, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, indulgence that neoliberalism, the, the Chicago view of uh, a school of economics have created. So uh, these voids have left many people, many places without voice or political recourse, and in fact, we see the consequence. Last thing I want to say is a personal thing. Uh, I was invited here more than four years ago by Attila Varga, and uh, he has been a great scholar in our community, has been uh, very good and close friends of mine for more than 20 years, he's not here today. I wanted just to say that my thoughts are with him, his wife Zita, and their beautiful girls. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.